Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction and thank you to SAGES for allowing us to present our research. I have no disclosures. So Zinker's diverticulum uh, is the protrusion of esophageal mucosa through Achilles triangle. It's a false diverticulum and it most commonly affects people in their seventh to eighth decade of life. Uh, the most common presenting symptom being dysphagia, um, but sometimes they'll complain of halitosis or regurgitation, et cetera. Uh, anyone who has symptoms from this, uh, it's worth offering them treatment. Traditionally, that was done via an open transcervical cricopharyngeal myotomy plus or minus diverticulectomy. Um, but that had several drawbacks. Uh, I mean, it still has its place, don't get me wrong, but it is a larger incision on the anterior neck. A drain often has to be placed, and then patients often have to be admitted to the hospital. Not only that, but the, comor or the morbidity rate of the procedure itself is reported as high as 46% in the literature. As with all things uh, in surgery, uh, we're moving toward a more minimally invasive approach, and so rigid endoscopy was brought up. Uh, that's predominantly formed by ENT surgeons, and it works fairly well, but there are several limitations to that as well. So if your patient has limited neck extension, uh, rigid endoscopy might not work as well. And uh, diverticulum size can also be a limitation of that. Then came flexible endoscopy. Uh, this is predominantly performed by GI uh, proceduralists when treating uh, zankers. And uh, that seemed to do a little better. The, uh, reported complication rate is somewhere around 15%, and the recurrence rate somewhere around 35% in the literature. Given that flexible endoscopy can be used on a wide range of sizes and doesn't have the drawbacks of open and rigid approach, the um, European Society, uh, the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, published some guidelines and said uh, flexible endoscopic cricopharyngeal myotomy should be thought of as first-line treatment for zankers. So general surgeons are trained in flexible endoscopy as well, so we thought, hey, there's not much out there in the literature that says whether general surgeons can do this. Let's do our own retrospective review on our patients and see how we match up. So we did just that. We did a retrospective analysis of 40 patients between 2018 and 2021. It was done by uh, one general surgeon at one institution and things we were interested, time until diet resumption, how long were they uh, admitted into the hospital, were there any complications, both intra-procedure and post-procedure, and how were their symptoms at follow-up? Were we doing the right thing? Were we helping the patients? And finally, did our patients do well or did they require additional treatment down the road? So uh, here's a table just looking at some baseline characteristics. As you can see, uh, predominantly, our, our patients were uh, in their seventh decade of life, uh, usually when this uh, occurred or when they were treated. Our range of diverticulum was anywhere from 10 millimeters all the way up to 90 millimeters. The procedure itself takes somewhere around an hour. And for those who were admitted to the hospital, the length of stay was about a day. So before we talk about uh, results and outcomes, I thought it'd be relevant just to talk about the procedure quickly. We use a standard EGD with a clear cap. We go through the oral pharynx and then we position it in the proximal esophagus until we get a picture that kind of resembles what you see on the slide here. So you can see a false uh, lumen, a true lumen, and then a septum in the middle. We use a hook knife, uh, we make a mucosotomy, and then we do a myotomy all the way down to the base of the false lumen, essentially obliterating the septum uh, at this point, there's a mucosal defect. We place a couple clips, and that's the end of the procedure. Sounds easier than it is. After the procedure, uh, it's routine now that we get a post-procedure esophagram immediately, and then pending those results, initiate a diet, and then uh, work toward discharge same day. I want to highlight here, though, that early in our practice, uh, we would routinely admit these patients, nil per us, and then do an esophagram on post-procedure day one. Uh, so just keep that in mind when we're looking at some of these results. So let's focus on the uh, top part of the table first regarding discharge timing and then time to diet resumption. So you can see most of our patients were actually able to be discharged on the same day of the procedure, 
and by the end of uh, post-procedure day two, nearly 95% uh, were in the comfort of their own homes. And this is why I brought up early in our, um, early in our uh, practice, we would routinely admit. So some of those patients who stayed a day or two, that was routine at the time. The same can be said for time to diet resumption. As you can see, most patients started a uh, full liquid diet the same day of the procedure. And by post-procedure day one, 92.5% uh, were on a liquid diet. All patients said that their symptoms had improved at follow-up visit. We didn't have any intra-procedure complications. We had uh, five post-procedure complications. All those were esophageal leaks that were seen on routine esophagram. And they were all able to close um, on their own without any sort of surgical intervention. And then we had um, seven recurrences. This is a multivariate analysis of just some categorical outcomes. I just wanted to highlight this one. So for patients who had recurrence, we found that they tended to be males more so than females. And I don't have a good answer for why this is. Uh, my literature search didn't report uh, sex as any sort of indicator as to failure. So it, it was an interesting finding, but uh, I don't have any um, reason for why it is. These figures outline the relation of the size of the diverticulum to whether or not patients had complications or recurrence. As you can see, there is an overlap of the ranges in both complication and recurrence, suggesting that diverticulum size might not be uh, an indicator. So to wrap this all up, what we learned from our study is that uh, general surgeons can perform flexible endoscopic cricopharyngeal myotomies with fairly good results, and we can do that on a wide range of diverticulum sizes. Our time to diet resumption and our time to discharge uh, are shorter than what is reported in the literature. And our complication rate, which was 12.5%, and the recurrence frequencies, 17.5%, uh, are similar to what's reported in the literature. And just to remind you, in the literature, the complication rate's about 15%, and the recurrence rate's about 35. Um, and then again, at the bottom, based on our figure, size of diverticulum does not appear to correlate with the frequency of complication and recurrence. So all in all, it may be safe for general surgeons to do this. The one limitation, or there's several, but it's one surgeon at one institution, and so a multi-centered study should be looked at to see if this is generalizable to the rest of general surgeons. Thank you.